The following is a long-awaited conversation with Mr. Sean Cahill and Mr. Lou Elizondo. Now, let me say that this conversation in which I had with these two gentlemen is quite starkly different, in my humble opinion, in conversation pertaining to the topics discussed than most other conversations in which these gentlemen have had. Now, that is not to disrespect or disparage any other interview in which any of you may have conducted or watched with these gentlemen. Actually, I want to thank those that have conducted such insightful interviews with Mr. Elizondo and Mr. Cahill. It's because of the community and you guys that I've been able to formulate hopefully half decent questions that you folks may again hopefully find insightful inquisitive and intriguing now before i jump into explaining a couple more things i do want to say that we do have a patreon www.patreon.com slash generation z it is the only thing that keeps the show going and again folks i have zero um this is zero disrespect to anyone not just within the uh, ufo uap community but in general i personally don't run ads simply because if i'm being entirely honest with you folks as i go about my day you know watching youtube videos on my phone and all that i don't want to put things out that i wouldn't want to have um, dare i say interrupting me myself so again this is no disrespect to anybody but that is why i am bringing up the patreon mainly because we don't run ads on the channel or any form of monetization in that regard now i also want to give a special thank you to mr alexi Novitsky and and also, I want to say that after this interview is aired, whether it's on the Patreon side or on the public side, within the next two weeks on this channel, live for free, public, we will be doing a live stream um, analysis of this interview so you folks can come visit the channel in real time speak with me in real time on the live chat as we play the interview we can you know engage in some good constructive criticism pertaining to which paths and topics we should or should not follow in my humble opinion and as well of course i will be shouting out a handful of other individuals that have helped me get to where i am uh, on that live stream as well so again without further ado folks please do enjoy cheers All right. Good morning. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. I I have no words for this simply because I have been extremely anticipate uh, anticipating this, and I've been uh, for uh, weeks now. I can safely say um, it's just been super excited for this. So, without further ado, we have with us Mr. Lou Elizondo and Mr. Sean Cahill, gentlemen. I want to say from the bottom of my heart, truly, thank the. I want to thank the both of you for your service. And how are you doing today? Good morning, Dave. How are you? I'm well. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. Dave, I'm doing uh, quite well. Um, I'm still coming off of a bit of a cold, so, uh, well, maybe a little bit more than that. So forgive me if I'm uh, into your wonderful audience if I come across uh, <laughs> a little bit disjointed, um, but I promise I'm going to do my best to stay coherent. I have a little bit of uh, medication in me. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lightweight. I, I don't even take Tylenol. So, uh, you know, hopefully I, <laughs> I have my all my wherewithal and my cognizance. No, uh, no problem at all. So honestly, I wanted to jump right into it, but I wanted to start actually with something that um, really stuck with me. And I say this simply because it is simply um, my perspective. And I say this for the audience. This doesn't mean that this is the correct perspective or anything like this. But um, I and I don't mean to take uh, neither of your gentlemen's words out of context here. But I remember, uh, Lou, you had said on Kurt's show, Kurt Jai Mungle, Theory of Everything last year, that um, when you were involved with a tip, sir, uh, when you were heading it, that you were shown some equations that made your eyes roll in the back of your head pertaining to transmedium. Um, and you had used the example precisely of like a knife going through butter. And this sort of resonated in a multi-pronged fashion for me because uh, it, it kind of gave me the sense that you guys are trying to put it, everything in front of our faces in the best way that you can without obviously breaching your, your oaths and what have you. And so what I mean by this is that just last night, I'm not even kidding, or the night prior, I went to go make myself a peanut butter and jam sandwich and there was a, a fresh tub of peanut butter. And I took the knife and I started putting it through the peanut butter and I said, holy shit, the peanut butter could represent, dare, dare I say, the world we're living in, and the knife could represent potentially UAP, uh, UAP craft, if you will, potentially. And it's simply voiding the space-time metric density. Um, in my humble opinion, I'm not saying that's what is. Is this a viable path one could pursue pertaining to that? Um, or is this something that you, uh, either of you would suggest is, 
not to pursue in, in, the, in the scientific regard? Well, great, great question. I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, and what I reference as the space between space. Uh, but before I do that, let me just take, take just a moment, Dave, and, and on behalf of Sean and myself, let me just take a moment to thank you for what you're doing. And thank you to your audience for listening. Um, you know, this is really a, a, for someone like you to come out like this and just take the bull by the horns and, and ask the questions uh, that probably a lot of people are thinking about, but don't get a chance to ask. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for being a champion to this cause. Um, obviously, we don't always agree on everything, which is the way life works and which makes makes life flavorful. But I want to thank you sincerely for everything you're doing. Uh, it is it is it is truly appreciated by by folks like Sean and I. And I also want to take just a quick shout out to your audience for taking the time to 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 listen in. Um, as you all know out there, Dave has done a really good job uh, trying to 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 help explore the nuances and mysteries of this already incredible enigma. Uh, there's a lot of facets to this conversation. And, and Zed, thank you. Dave, Mr. Zed, thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, it, it's very much, again, it's appreciated. And you're having, a, you are providing a, a benefit, I think, um, beyond what most people will, will uh, superficially appreciate. So thank you. Thank you, guys, truly. Thank you. So back to your question. Um, so when it comes to transmedium travel, um, there are different sets of coefficients as it relates to, to the medium in which you're operating in. So let's, let's take this little model airplane that I always keep on my desk as reference, okay? This little model airplane is shaped like this because it flies through the air. Now, it, 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 there's a lot of things that this aircraft would have to deal with when flying. And the faster you go, the more it has to deal with some of these effects. So for example, you have friction on the front, okay, and you have resistance, and then you have drag off the back of the aircraft. These are all, all, all issues that an aircraft has to face. And then the faster it goes, you start dealing with shock waves, right, and what they call bow wave as well. And so uh, aircraft are pointing like this because it has to punch through the shock wave. If it was blunt, it'd be much more difficult, take a lot more power to do it. So an aircraft, in essence, looks like an airplane because if, and it, it, the fast ones look more or, less, more or less like this, because it has to deal with atmospheric forces. Now, uh, a rocket, which is a little different, uh, has to deal with those same forces, but only for a very short period of time while it's going through the Earth's atmosphere. But in space, let's say this is your rocket, you have a bunch of different forces now, okay? So you, have, you don't have air friction anymore uh, and resistance and drag, uh, but you have inertia and other issues that you're gonna have to deal with. And so a rocket has to use thrusters to maneuver in space. Um, it doesn't have to be overly aerodynamic, like I said, only just to punch through the atmosphere. And a submarine is dealing with a very, very thick medium, comparatively speaking. A lot of people don't think water being thick, for example, like a solid, but, but it is comparatively. That's why, unfortunately, when a lot of people decide to take their own lives and they jump from a bridge, usually they die upon impact. Um, because even though it's water, uh, it feels the faster you fall, the more that, 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 that water, uh, <laughs> frankly, acts like a solid. Um, and so, so there's all different force, fundamental force you have to deal with. And so uh, when I said cutting a, a knife through butter, I meant a few things. One, I meant on the superficially that um, if you had a UAP that looked like a Tic Tac or a disc or a triangle or anything else, and it wanted to fly underwater, well, at very high speeds, you would have a lot of different issues you'd have to deal with physics that would be very problematic for you to travel very, very fast. Now, there are a few things that travel fast we now know about super cavitational torpedoes and, and, and submersibles like that from, from, from what's out in open source, but there's a speed limitation to that. In fact, there's even a speed limitation to sonar. Um, sonar is, is, is basically like radar, but it travels at the speed of sound underwater. Now, the speed of sound underwater is significantly faster than the speed of sound in air because water's denser, but there's still a speed limit. We are seeing objects moving much, much, much faster even than that. And so what that tells us is that you have an object, a technology, forgive me, I have something in my eye. You have the, uh, a technology that has the ability to, to travel much faster than what normal physics would allow. Now, it's not that they're breaking the laws of physics, it's just that there's probably, a, a, there's an understanding there of physics better than we have. Also, uh, yes, there is also a space-time aspect to that comment, which you picked up on. Uh, that's the second layer of the conversation about cutting through life through through 
through butter, a hot knife through butter. Um, you know, a hot knife will cut through 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 a stick of butter very very quickly, um, and there's reasons for that. And the, the the equation that I was provided was provided by some of the best scientists we had at the time in the U.S. government, by the way, on the U.S. government payroll, uh, explaining how how these objects uh, not only can be transmedium like that, but can also potentially understand space time in a similar fashion, in where that um, an object traveling through space time. Uh, that has a certain understanding of, of physics uh, would not have the same issues that 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 we have. In fact, space time may may be experienced fundamentally different uh, when you are the knife versus the butter, right? So we we live in the butter, but if you're a hot knife, well, you can travel through that 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 stick of butter a lot faster than let's say a fly stuck on the surface, right? Because you're, you're you're that's your environment, whereas a hot knife can slice right through it. So um, good, good, good observation, good call. Uh, both are, are potentially possible. They are, they are hypothesis at this time, uh, maybe a little bit more than a hypothesis. And, um, and yeah, so, so there you go. There's, there's the exp explanation on, on, on my, uh, my analogy. Like you, you know, I, I, uh, I come from a big Latin family, so we use analogies. I'm not particularly the smart, the smartest, uh, or, uh, or maybe sharpest blade in, in the, uh, in the drawer. And so, for me, analogies help me understand complicated principles. It allows me to distill the essence of something that's very complicated and then apply it in a, in a very uh, routine and normal sense. And so that's why you'll hear me use analogies a lot, because for me, I find it very helpful. Maybe it, it might be a little bit annoying for some folks because I know you use a lot of them, but, but it helps me uh, grasp some of these, these more difficult concepts. Thank you, sir. And uh, Mr. Cahill, yourself, thoughts on, on that, uh, dare I say, proposal, hypothesis, co uh, concept? Well, I think what, what um, Lou was talking about with analogies is, is perfect because I don't have the math. I, I'm a generalist. I have a generalist view, so I have to speak in analogies. But I think that what you're, what you're talking about and what Lou talking about mesh together at a certain point because the way that we're inspired to reach upwards for new inventions and things like that is noticing the simplicity of things that are already there and, you know, extrapolating out what they could be. So, you know, whether it's watching a video on the internet of somebody's base in their car, make the metal and the glass turn into a, suddenly a liquid, um, or whether it's a hot knife through butter. For me, at the end of the day, the, it scales, you know, we should be reaching for those ideals and trying to look in those areas. But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, how do we, before we start trying to achieve these things, how do you do it without leaving a trail of melted butter everywhere? And, and things like, and, and you know, because as, as Lou said, affecting the medium is one of the things that we're, we're trying to understand here. You don't want to affect the medium in a destructive manner. And what we're seeing most of the time with UAP, most of the time, I would say, is not leaving destructive evidence behind in the environment or the medium it's transiting. Got you. Thank you. Now, with that being said, to follow up on that, this goes again, a question to, to both of you. Um, I don't mean to uh, put you on the spot pertaining to this particular film I'm about to reference, but there's a film that came out that directed by Mr. Zack Snyder in 2009 called Watchmen. And there was a particular character in that film called Rorschach. And this individual had essentially this mask that constantly had this black ink within the fabric of the mask, and it was always changing. And the purpose of that is that he was basically a, um, uh, basically trying to pull a Batman, if you will, trying to stand up for the ones in the city that were being, you know, beaten up and, and all of this in the comic books that couldn't uh, stand up for themselves. And the purpose of the mask was that whenever he would approach any of these uh, bad guys, it would instill a sense of fear in the bad guys or the villains in this story that um, made them each respectively and individually see and interpret that mask and that black ink as their own projection of their subconscious fear. Um, dare I, again, go, just potentially, hypothetically, we're just exploring ideas here. Is, could one potentially follow the path or hypothesis that this is what the phenomenon may or may not be? And without taking words out of context with anyone, um, this speaks to me personally of Mr. Jacques Vallée claiming that he still doesn't know what UAPs are and what the phenomenon is. And uh, it really resonated with me right when you said there, Mr. Cahill, it's to scale. So that's, this to me speaks to a collective unison of different perspectives. 
and that concept of the mask meaning something different to each villain to instill fear in them do you guys see where i'm going with this is this potentially what the phenomenon could be doing from my standpoint um not ha as an observer of what other people would call um uh special operations or you know clandestine services books i've read i've not participated in operations like that i would say that in and pardon me i'm not i'm just again speaking to what you said not speaking necessarily to a, a statement of fact but an, a the beginnings of a of two communities interacting in a modern sense are going to begin with military and intelligence infiltration the first thing that the that the whether they're friend or foe that they're going to do is determine what are your capabilities what are your what is your infrastructure what is your societal makeup those kinds of things um now when when someone is going to want to do that they don't want to identify themselves as a foreign asset they would want to be they would want it to be clandestine and when we take the the whole of the the experience or zeitgeist together without without running it through a sieve we can see that, that there is a roulette wheel of presentation there are some archetypes that seem to stick around but then again there's an interesting uh, there are a lot of interesting um, anomalies throughout those accounts um to me bouncing that off the work of Jacques Vallée especially it does and my own experience and an interest in this it does speak to me of a of as i said a roulette wheel of presentation now whether that means that we're experiencing the plethora of life that exists outside this gravity well in a near infinite universe i don't know it could be just be something as simple as we set off our nukes and called everybody to come see who the new the new fools on the block were and enough of them showed up and said okay not interested and went home and but at the same time we have we have there are psychological con constructs for lack of a better word like the, the like alien face syndrome where you can flash two two sets of pictures up on either side of a central point and those the brain tries to merge them together and it presents a different face so again when we're talking scaling i see a possibility for that now what's the apparatus what's the medium of transmission i have i don't i don't know yeah, I'll, I'll jump in too, uh, Dave. So, you know, there's it, a lot of people are familiar with with the ink blots that um, some some psychologists will use to determine what someone's uh, personality traits are, right? And ink blots are interesting because really they're just random ink blots. But people will see different people will see different things, and that's based upon um, fears and desires and experiences we have, right? We see kind of what the brain projects. Uh, what we should see, right? But that's different for every person. And so fear, fear and desire are actually really similar in a lot of ways because they're super individualistic. Some people are afraid of spiders. Some people are afraid of heights, right? Some people are uh, afraid of, of, of the IRS, right? So uh, fear is relative and so is, is desire. You know, people desire different things. Some people desire attention. Some people desire money. Some people desire... Um, you know, uh, all, all sorts of stuff, uh, you know, whether it's, it's drugs or, or anything else. So, so desires are also unique, just like fears are for each individual person. And, and when you look at something like this, like a UAP, it will instill different um, feelings for, for different people, right? We interpret the information differently. Um, some say oh, it would be a beautiful, wondrous experience, while other people report it being absolutely terrifying. So it's, it's relative and, you know, very much like the analogy you use with this, I, I'm not familiar with the superhero, forgive me, but, but I think it's very clever because very much like a, a black mask that projects the person's fear is very much like an ink block. You're going to see what your mind wants to see. And to some degree, that's, that's similar with the UAP. And some people approach it very scientifically. Some people appro approach it spiritually. Some people approach it more from a technological perspective, and, and some even approach it from a philosophical perspective. And, and there lies the conundrum, because, because this topic means so many things to so many different people. Got you. So to add to that, um, to add with another metaphor, and I, I simply I want to uh, reinforce for the audience, whoever uh, is listening or watching to this uh, down the road, we are simply exploring ideas. I'm not uh, asking Mr. Elizondo nor Mr. Cahill to speak on behalf of any um, institution or anything like this. But for example, um, say cell phones, when we have um, 
say, you know, whether it's an Android phone, an iPhone, you name it. Um, we all have our apps scattered on different parts of the home screen or different, you know, you may have your text messaging app, uh, sir, on, you know, the bottom dock. I may have it on the second page in a folder. We have different ways of getting there, but either way, regardless, we still got to the same location. Does this, does this substantial, could this potentially follow that same line of thought? Yeah, I think, I think that's a beautiful way to describe it, right? The, the destination is ultimately the same, but the journey may be different, if that makes sense. Right, right. Thank you. Now, uh, yeah, also yourself, um, Mr. Cahill. Oh, well, I concur. I gotcha. don't have much to add to that. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, so we see, um, for example, ne uh, next question here that, um, and this is simply just a hypothesis of mine. I am not stating this as fact. I want to be clear to the audience. It, I have explored the possibility that within intelligence activities, when a hacker, whether nation state or independent, uh, foreign or domestic, when a hacker penetrates a database, um, when an agency notices such a hack, generally speaking, as I have come to personally understand it, I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone or anything, um, the agency that is viewing the hacker do this, they will not kick the hacker out for a multitude of reasons, for counterintelligence purposes, you name it, but rather um, it's been speculated they will transfer the hacker in real time without the hacker knowing to a, dare, part of my English here, a bullshit server with uh, seeming, you know, infer with false information. And the hacker, they just let the hacker go and see what they take and where they go and who they report back to and all of this. Um, could this potentially be done with human consciousness? I, uh, potentially? Sean, you want to take that one to start? You know, it, it, again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend we didn't just have a big conversation about scaling. Um, but, and again, not a brain, not a neuroscientist, but brainwave activity tells us that there's, there's a, there's a signal of sorts. Um, now, if we're being if we're being very general, every day we turn on our television, pick up our iPhone, um, drive by a billboard, we're being influenced. Um, now, I can tell my Alexa to play a certain frequency with music behind it, and I can influence the moods of my family. Um, I can, I you know, music in a movie. We have certain tones, frequencies, chords, and, and notes that will instill um, a sense of fear, mystery, foreboding. We know how to build people's emotions up for a jump scare or for a reveal. Um, again, this a lot of times for me goes back to mindfulness, goes back to self-awareness, but there are a lot of ways that human consciousness, as we call it, whatever that thing is, there are ways that it can be influenced and I dare say manipulated. Um, so when you talk about shunting a human experience into another realm, you know, we're, we're kind of getting into, you know, science fiction and movies here. You know, we're talking about things like inception or, or you know, a hijacking of your consciousness. But to someone who wanted to really delve into the nuts and bolts of, again, how things scale, there's a possibility there. It, it's far beyond my understanding. Um, but I also am one of, I am a person who sees consciousness as non-local. And that's, that's honestly, in a lot of ways for us, that's, that's the first question. Because if you don't see consciousness as non-local, if you have a materialist view, it's very easy to take a very selfish, narcissistic view of this existence. You've only got 75 years. I'm going to get mine. And you're going to pass up. You're going to deny that manipulation because you see yourself as such a strong individual and such a strong ego. There's no way anyone could get inside of you because those things don't exist. I don't want to go too deep into it, you know, start talking about the matrix and things like that. But we need, we have more exploring of this, of this existence to do more understanding of the bodies. We, I say, inhabit for lack of a better word. Um, but to me, that's the crux of it because if, if those possibilities exist, they have to be explored. And whether we're talking about something that's very long reaching like third body problem, where what if we're just looking into the future and trying to consider what if this phenomenon is not the simple thing we think it is. We have a very, you know, a very long-term relationship with the universe ahead of us. And we do have to look out for, for people that are running the galaxy like a server rather than a, a physicality. 
pardon me, I don't know if those words really track, but I guess what I'm saying here is there, there's, a, there's a possibility that that may be true and therefore we should look in those areas and try to safeguard ourselves. Um, because I, I am constantly considering outsider threat in this until the, the phenomenon itself you know, reveals itself or we have a better, a better eye to eye understanding of it. Um, so to me, it's, it's an important area of study. Yeah. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, Sean, you, you actually kind of, in a way, hijacked what I was just going to say, which is great. Um, so a couple things. So first of all, let's, let's talk about music. Okay. Um, music does precisely that. It, it manipulates human emotion and human thought. In fact, if you were to watch either a horror movie or a love movie uh, and take away all the music, it actually wouldn't make much sense. It actually seems kind of silly. It's only when you add that layer of music can you bring the entire audience on this ride with you and get them all thinking in the same terms that you're trying to, to project. So, so music does absolutely do that. And it doesn't matter if you are you know, Eminem or James Taylor or uh, Bob Dylan. All of them are looking for that moment, that perfect song that delivers the audience, the listener to that state of nirvana, right? We are only, we are limited by language by, because it's language, it's, 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 it's verbal cues and it's close to being able to read each other's mind, but not precise enough, right? So it gets us kind of close there. And so all these artists are, are, are reaching for that essence, for that, that again, you call the perfect song. And I think if you ask any artist, they're all in their deep, in their soul, in their heart, are deeply searching for that, that, that perfect song that will define the human experience for that moment, you know, and they'll never be, never need to be another song again for that emotion. Um, but, you know, it's not just, just music. There's been efforts by the U.S. government in the past to, to quote unquote, hijack human consciousness. And, and that was done, you know, in the days of, of some of the experimentation early days of MK Ultra, where we used pharmaceuticals to try to, 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 to take a, a, um, a certain type of personality and change it to, to a personality and to do things and think way, the way that we, we wanted them to think. Uh, of course, that's very, very unethical, but, but pharmaceuticals have been used for many, many years to do just that. I'll give you another case in point of a reality. Go to Vegas on any time, go to any casino. They spend millions of dollars each year just on scent, on scent. They, they inject the smell of either a really nice cologne or even in some cases money because it can, it can change human conscious and conscious, consciousness and decisions in a way that they feel is more favorable to, to, the, to the bottom line profit. People spend more money. If, and so there's five fundamental senses in which we, we judge the universe, right? So we can see it, we can hear it, we can taste it, we can smell it, et cetera. Um, those are all very, very important for us to, to make decisions and, and in, in essence, make, make you know, conscious decisions that are based on human consciousness. So um, it's really not that far out there. I, I think it's a really good question. And uh, I think Sean hit the nail right on the head. Thank you so much. Now, speaking of that, um, you guys have brought up non-locality. And so before um, I bring up a just a, a virtual whiteboard, this will be the only time I share my screen. Um, I did a bit of a, a handmade sketch just to kind of show you guys. Um, I think Sean knows where has an idea where I'm going with this. But uh, uh, this concept of non-locality, Lou, in the past, you've brought up this this idea of um, a uh, and again, please uh, forgive me if I'm plucking words out of context here like a, the cherry of a cigarette. Everything's happening simultaneously, all at the same time. Is this correct, sir? Uh, so you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, apologies. Um, yeah, it goes to a bigger, to a bigger question of what, what, is, what is time? Okay. What, what is time? Um, most of us think time is, is an event, but time is not an event. There is no such thing as, 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 as now. There, there's, time is a process. And it's a transition. It is a transition between the future and the past. If I were to ask someone in the most simplest terms, what is their definition of the future? It is events that have not happened yet. And by that same description, if I ask, well, what's your definition of the past? Well, it's events that have already happened. So what is the present? Well, the present is this infinitesimally small moment of space time, very elusive because it's constantly moving forward where the future transitions into the past. We say we're living in the present, but, but we're not really living in the present. Uh, and if you were to, to use the analogy that I've often been 
use, which is a cigarette or a cigar burning, one may look at the future being, is that part of the cigar that hasn't burned yet, right? It's, it's intact, but we don't know what it's going to taste like or smell like. The past are the ashes. We can't go back and, and, and put those ashes together and relive that, that moment. So the, the present is really this, this expression where the future is transitioning into the past. And that's where we, we, we learn all the things that, that, that we know and that we, all the experiences that we have. We love and hate and fear and everything else is, is expression of that very, very, very small moment of space time, probably measured in plank time. Now, if you were to get down in the very, very small, take that cigar that's burning and, and remove away a lot of the glow and really, really look, drill into it, blow it up so you can look what it looks like inside that cherry, which is where that, that, that present lives. You would notice that, that that cherry burns unevenly. That moment of ignition is not really, it's hard to define because in the cherry, there are pieces of the future that are actually burning after pieces of the past. It's, it's disjointed. And so therefore, it's very, the further you go down into, into the plank world, the harder and harder it becomes to define what is now. And is it possible that, uh, you know, we, we know from a physics perspective, that uh, there's this, this, this duality principle of the electron. When I was a kid, we learned that the electron orbits the atom and we now real the, the nucleus of the atom, we now realize that's not true. It's called an electron cloud. And the reason is because that electron is actually nowhere and there all at the same time. It's all around the atom. And some scientists have speculated because the atom is so small, it is literally zipping in and out of existence, trillions upon trillions of times a second, and that's why it's here, and it's it's everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. And that being the case, which is is a, a an actual physical model, if you will, of of, of what, what I'm trying to to explain as far as space time, um, you know, at the very very small space time, kind of breaks down, and also at the very very large. And so we are kind of this uncomfortable middle where we're kind of living in the cherry. But is it possible that? where that, that some people, some human beings can experience space, time, uh, the present, that cherry, it's just a bigger cherry on the cigar. More of the future, more of the past are being experienced as, as if it's happening now. Um, is, that, is that possible? Would that explain why remote viewing, for example, is possible? Does that explain why, why some people have these premonitions and can see things in the future, allegedly or in the past, with a great deal of, of accuracy and fidelity, right? Would that now, and what if, let's take that a step further. What if space time uh, wasn't just something like we experienced temporally, but time itself had three dimensions, right? We tend to experience the universe right now in three physical dimensions. You have an X axis, a Y axis, and a Z axis. And within those dimensions, I can physically move anywhere in my, my space. And time being, an, being the fourth dimension, little bit more experienced a little bit more linearly by certainly by by our species but is it possible that that other species may also experience time in in, in a th more of a three-dimensional sense whereas if you and i are right now having this conversation we interact with each other but but let's say you had the power where where time itself was experienced three-dimensionally so you could be here having this conversation with me five minutes now or five minutes ago and unless i have that ability i'll never be able to interact with Ever. Only when you are right here, right now, do I get to interact with you. And so that's, you know, that's also a, a, a very interesting idea that, that has been batted around. Uh, Sean? Um, I've been meditating for six years, and I don't claim to be any kind of, um, pretty much on the daily. Uh, and I don't claim to be any kind of uh, guru. And I'm not, I'm not about to claim like any kind of like telekinesis or superpowers. But I will tell you that what it has shown me is that, again, we talk about scaling. On a personal level, my anxieties that I had throughout my life previous to this moment, um, things that worried me, scared me, got me to react instead of respond, um, those things are, are more at my control now that I've achieved a certain level of mindfulness. That I've under, that for me, the concept of stretching that now out. So for a very anxious person, their now is, is almost not under their control whatsoever. They're a product of their environment. The dog barks, the person yells, the car screeches, the deadline is coming up. They're, they're just a creature of circumstance. Now, 
something that I noticed, and again, not claiming any kind of superpowers or anything, but one thing that really um, improved for me over time were my reflexes. Um, just something as simple as when something falls you know, out of the refrigerator or gets knocked off the counter or something. Now, a lot of us, we, we have, you know, we'll jerk for it and we miss it or we don't do anything. In this case, it honestly feels like sometimes one of those um, science fiction movies or DC movies with like Flash where he's running around someone slowly because in that moment, I'm very calm. And instead of freaking out and jerking or, or reacting, I just reach out and take the thing out of the air before it hits the ground. And that's how it feels. Now, it feels really cool like that. You want to turn around to everybody and say you did a really awesome thing. But what it turned out to feel like was that I was just here in the now experiencing the moment and so you and I had a, had a brief chat about about extending that now out and and we talked about some things that I think were done um I, I somebody in the audience will fix me if I get it wrong but I think it was Dean Radin's work um but they did some experiments in the, in the laboratory where a control group and an experimental group were given the same battery of tests but the experimental group was given all of the correct answers immediately following the test. And the group that was given the correct answers after the fact did remarkably better than the control group that was never given those correct answers. And so it shows us a kind of loop in the now. The question is, is how short is that loop? How long is that loop? And if I can have those little moments of grabbing the butter before it hits the floor and the dog runs away with it, I can extrapolate that up to something that, that's more advanced or more, or more enlightened than I am, extending their now out. And then that gives them almost infinitely more choices than I had. Because I'm a creature of my environment, trying to become more aware, trying to become a part of my environment instead of a product of it. And they may have already achieved that. And so, if, again, if that scales up into a technological area, and into a personal perceptional area, it may not even feel like I'm living in the same universe as them. You know, can I jump in on that real quick, Dave? Because Sean Please. says something again that's that's extremely interesting. I'll share with you a personal story. Um, you know, a lot of people when they get in through through traumatic experiences, time seems to slow down for them, right? And that's that's mm -hmm. that's an experience for them. But I'll tell you, I'll share something personal. Um, about ten years ago, I got into a car accident. Um, I uh, I was hit head on by by a Chevy Suburban. It was doing about 60 miles an hour. And normally when you get into a car accident, a lot of people don't remember anything. Um, and also when they hit, it's just a bang. Um, and then it lights out. That wasn't, that's not what happened. To me. Um, it, I almost became hyper aware. I actually, believe it or not, I, it, it's the most bizarre experience. Not only did time slow down, but I could actually in real time feel the crunch zones in the vehicle beginning to collapse and then the vehicle move forward and then more, more of those crunch zones in the car that are designed to absorb the shock. I could feel them collapsing and the car beginning to decelerate and then, and then once a, a, collapse, a, a crunch zone had exhausted itself. I felt the shock again and also it, it was this incredible experience and I wonder that if if I at the time realized what was going on, is there something I could have done, right? Did I have more options rather than just maybe, maybe I could have started turning the wheel slightly and, and create even less of a shock. But I remember it completely. I never blacked out and everything went in slow motion, but even not even my thought processes, even my physical experiences of the car accident, it felt more like five seconds of the crash and not just you know, a, a, a hundredth of a second, which is really what those things are. Bang, it's over. But, but that's not the way I experienced it. It was really, really bizarre. I remember telling my wife afterwards, I said, you're not going to believe this, but, but I actually felt the, the car absorbing the shock. Every inch that that suburban was coming closer and closer to me, I felt the engine drop down and I feel this, um, it's almost like crinkling a paper bag, just kind of and doing it slowly. I, I, I felt that, and it was really, really bizarre. So I just wanted to share that with you because Sean brings up a really interesting point because not only does it, did time feel like it went slower, it actually felt like I, I was consciously aware of what was going on. And, you know, it, it was, I'm making a joke, of course, it's like I could sit back and have a cup of tea while that was happening, but it really, it, it was, that event really happened that way. And it was really interesting. And so this 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 notion of time being relative is is real. 
I would I would like to thank you so much uh, to the both of you for that because I also want it was it was Dean Radin, um, uh, Mr. Cahill, pertaining to that academic paper and. I want to thank you for that personally, because uh, when you had told me uh, prior about that paper, when you had said, hey, take a look at this, it really helped me uh, visualize uh, things pertaining to cause and effect. It made me personally think that when one is, uh, dare I say, uh, potentially accurately remote viewing, they can remote view because it's not necessarily the future, neither the past. It's already happened, but it hasn't. So it, it, it does that make sense? Oh, it does to me that be, and we also have to add in that, that there's studies have been done on these things and, and uh, the majority of, of naysayers and skeptics and, and armchair contrarians can discount it all, but the, the, the study continues and it, it does show us that that, that, that concept of, of a certain fluidity around the, the moment is, is true. Um, I think true and true is a strong word. Um, but I want to take that to a, to another area and say, we can't conflate that with suddenly being psychic. We can't conflate that with suddenly having powers or knowledge, because there are so many things that these rat that the rational academic based studies have have realized and determined or involved with this, that we have to be very careful of our conclusions. Um, what we call analytical or emotional overlay is is related to what Lou talked about earlier. When the first time you see an elephant. If you don't know what an elephant is, you, you saw a hippo with a snake on its face and some, some giant fans on its head, and it didn't make any sense to you. And it was going to take a long time before you conceptualize that. Um, so that our personal perceptions and biases and other things are going to color whatever information we're getting back from the system that we're talking about right now. And so I agree with you that, you know, you might be looking at a past that, pardon me, that may have happened. Let's not get too science fiction, but let's talk about you're looking at a direct linear past and it happened, but your analytical overlay is painting it in a very different way. Um, you, you know, who, who, what was the reality of the situation, vice what you're watching, vice what you're seeing. Um, so again, that aside, I, I think that these, that this information seems to exist, the, the, a plethora of verifiable under certain blind circumstances, information seems to exist in ether we don't quite understand yet, for lack of a better word. Um, accessing these things, though, to me, requires discipline. Understanding them requires discipline and integrity. So I just I don't want to willy nilly give people a carte blanche that and say, I think psychic stuff exists and I and everything that you experience is your experience and we should all believe each other. Um, I think we need to socialize and share more of those experiences, especially with academia. So they, they've been working with a very small pool of people for a very long time. So the possibilities certainly exist um, for, what we're to, for what we're discussing here. Um, but I, I always want to be careful how we apply it and how quickly we get off the freeway and say, Eureka, I've got it. Right. You know what? I'm going to, if I get it, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but um, the notion of time is rather profound. Let me give you a real example that you know we probably take for granted every day. Um, there is special photography called high-speed photography. And we see some of these beautiful illuminations of, of things that the human being can't perceive. Um, in fact, fantastically fast that we look and said, it, it's a blink of an eye. But let, let me give you a real, real scenario here, for example, if you give me a second. And let me caveat, um, I do not, uh, I'm doing this for demonstration purposes only, but there is some famous video of a, of, of a bullet being fired out of a gun hitting a car, uh, a plane car. And, and, and when you see it in normal time, it's happening so fast, it's, you can't, okay, what just happened? Okay, it, it blew up a car. But, but when you freeze frame it and you can really see that moment of impact where that bullet is beginning to hit that plane car and spread and separate that plane car, and each photograph, look at the bullet, the detail, the scratches, the nuances, the reflection of it, right? It's frozen in time. And now we have the time to study it because that event really, really, really happened. And to the bullet, that, that moment in time is just normal. The life of a bullet, as we know, is, you know, half a second, right? Uh, but that's its entire lifetime for the most part. Um, 
And yet for us, it goes by like that. But when you look at that still photography and look at the look at the detail, or maybe perhaps a better example is a hummingbird's wings flying, flapping. We look at it just looks like a buzz thousands and thousands of times per, per, per minute, when in reality, uh, to that hummingbird, um, it, it, it's not experienced quite like that, right? Same with uh, perhaps a, a fly that lives its entire life in one day. We say, oh, how sad, but you know, to a tortoise that lives 200 years, well, human beings live 75 years on average. Wow, how sad, but, but yet it's an entire lifetime for us. We experience a full life in that amount of time. Whereas in other things, it doesn't. Another thing interesting is scalability. You know, when you look at most of the universe, most of it, the smaller things are, the quicker time goes by. And it seems to be this exponential, the larger you go, the, the, the longer time exists. So you can start from the very, very small, uh, you know, what is the, the, the life, for example, of, of, of a blood cell? Well, it's about 90 days. And what's the life of a human being? Well, maybe 90 years. What's the life? Uh, of a much bigger thing like a planet, well, maybe, you know, nine billion years. What's the, the, the life of a universe? Well, maybe 90 trillion years. You know, the bigger you go, um, the, the, the more that, that time is experienced a little bit differently. Um, you know, and also the faster things move, the smaller you go, right? To, to make up for that lost time, I guess. Does vibration so, you know, have anything to do with that? Quite possibly. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm one of those folks that says vibrations everything, because I've, I've, in my philosophical beliefs, I've gotten to the point where I see that we're just, the, all of our existence is just a bell ringing, but that's just a philosophical point, right. and, and it's not enough for somebody like me to pardon me to just bark up, yes, that that's not cool, but um, everywhere I look, everything's vibrating. Gotcha. Um, you know, wh whether it's the electron cloud, whether it's the the guitar string on the guitar. Um, whether it's the resonance of an engine on an F-18 as it goes overhead, everything in our, in our environment is vibrating. It's not as simple just to say everything is vibration and resonance. We need people to understand that. Um, there's a huge difference between, you know, going back, we talked about the hot knife through butter, at least in that analogy, that, that knife has been, had heat applied to it. So it's vibrating at a higher level and it's going to cut differently than a knife that's just going to tear through the cells of, of the of cellulose or something like that. But I want to I want to be really careful. I always say that because I speak in a generalist tone, and I get asked a lot of specific questions, and I'm willing to give opinions and, and clarify on those things. But it's really important that people not just take what Lou and I are saying as as any kind of gospel or place to to set their beliefs in. These are, these are stepping off points to research areas that will spread across the phenomenon under, for understanding. Um, it's one so slice I, yeah. of the pizza. Well, yeah, and I also don't want to, I don't want to be cagey because a lot of people come away with ideas. Oh, well, they know more than they're letting on or what are they trying to say with this? And it's like, don't try to figure out what we're trying to say. Just go learn some stuff. You know, you know what I mean? We're, we're trying to expose you to things that we've learned about. And, and as you are, because we've, we've talked about some of these, these questions and what might be meaningful questions. Um, but it's important that folks use their own imaginations because it's, it's not just Sean or Lou might be right or the people Sean or Lou read or talked to might be right or worked with. We need a lot more people. These concepts aren't, these concepts are too big just to leave to academia alone. You know what I mean? Like they have to be understood, socialized, talked about. Right. If so. I could say very quickly, I know Lou, it seems like you want to jump in on, uh, particularly on, um, on, on my Patreon, where we explore a lot more of these concepts. I always say, uh, I, I start usually with saying, because I get excited, I say, guys, I got it. But I make it very clear to state that when I say I got it, that's just one little piece of the metaphorical pie. That doesn't mean that I have the end all be all answer. The concept of this collective unison of to me personally speaks to non-locality and I'll, I'll bring up that whiteboard shortly, but uh, please Lou. You know, it's, it, it's interesting, Dave, you, you talk about vibration. Vibration is, is that, is that one of the fundamental keys? Um, you know, Sean talked about the guitar. He talked about, you know, an engine. He talked about, you know, vibration is, is, is interesting because vibration is really a product of one thing and that's motion movement. So let's, if we can, I, I, I would encourage 
your audience right now for just a moment. I'm going to digress and just try to clear your mind for just, just the next couple moments because I want to talk about something that might help people understand to some degree um, the wonders of the universe and even potentially the human mind. Um, there is fundamentally two things in, in our reality. It's either existence or non-existence. Can you have matter, a thing, existence, without a space? No, you can't. You must have a space in order to, if you have matter, if you have some essence of something, it must exist in something else. So therefore, matter must exist in space. But matter by itself in a space doesn't do anything and it doesn't mean anything. It's only when that matter is in relationship to another matter, piece of matter, does it mean anything. And even then it still does, there's no such thing as time because what is time? Well, first of all, space is the distance between two points. What is time? Time is, is the, the, the measure uh, in order to go for, it takes to go from one piece of matter to another. That's all it is, right? It's a measurement. So I have two pieces of matter in a space. The distance is an arbitrary amount of length between the two, right? And time is what does it, what is the measurement it, it, it takes to go from here to here, right? And that's all time is. And so you can't define, way, you can't define one without the other. Correct. And only when these things are actually movement right because if i have a static universe where every single piece of matter every electron every atom everything is just frozen and then therefore you there is no there, there really this notion of time pretty much stops because there's no clock anymore because there's no reference because there's no motion if you don't have motion then you don't have an ability to 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 make because everything is static and so, so motion is required in order for there to be time. Time, without motion, time does not exist. You have to have motion. And I'm talking at the, both the grand scale and the very micro scale. So, so time is a really interesting dimension. It's something that we still don't really, really understand. And in fact, even the scalability things, we think that the universe is so big and, the, and you know, of course the atom is so small. Well, that's relative because let's go back to our two fundamental examples of two pieces of matter all of a sudden now let's say you you right now dave pop into existence into a space undefined just you now exist nothing else around you nothing you can see nothing you can take nothing you're just there right you have no idea how big you are you have no idea how small you are and you don't even know if you're moving because there's nothing else to measure that movement so you're just there existing in a right. space all of a sudden sean pops into existence boom there he is now he's in front of you but you don't know still if you are the size of an atom and he's another atom, or if you're the size of a galaxy and he's the size of a galaxy, because there's still no relationship. Because you're fundamentally the same size and you're over there. But you don't know what that means over there. You don't know. There's still no scalability. There's right? no pillar to and compare it to. There's no pillar to compare it. Now, I can make a bunch of smaller Sean's and you can say, well, I'm bigger than that. And I can make a bunch of bigger Sean's and you say, well, I'm smaller <laughs> than that. But you still don't have any understanding of real size and scale, right? And then there's distance. Well, you are over there. So therefore, I'm going to arbitrarily say you are four inches or you're four miles or you're four light years. It doesn't matter because that, that distance, too, is relative. We know we measure everything by the speed of light. But in the grand scale of things, we don't know how fast that really is or how slow it is. I mean, we know it's you know, 186,000 miles per second, blah, blah, blah. But, but we don't know really in the big scale of things, is that, that, is that fast? I mean, it seems fast to us. Or, or really the big fundamental thing is that is it slow? Is that just a, a speed limit we've imposed upon ourselves because of the understanding we have of the environment around us, but that may really not be a universal speed limit, right? So, so vibration, back to the question, your discussion about vibration, vibration is a manifestation of movement, whether it's electromagnetically or it's acoustically or, or physically, whatever. Um, and, and that is a, all a result of motion which is all a result of matter in a, in a particular space. And I don't think we have a good enough understanding of that notion really to even begin to, to, to have any definitive answers. Is everything based on vibration? Yes, it is. Because vibration is a product of that motion. You can't get away from it. 
whether it's a pulsar somewhere in another galaxy or it's uh, you know, a radio signature coming from a neutron star in our own galaxy or it's light hitting our eye, it's a vibrational wave coming from the sun. Everything is a vibration. Thank you. So this is um, just to sort of wrap this up before we go on. It, could we use the example of, say, um, let's just say for the sake of this example, just a total, uh, you know, hypothetical, a baby's born an extremely intelligent baby. Now, day one, it's got the brain of a 30 year old, but it has not interpreted or absorbed any, any information yet. And it can understand his or her mother and say, it, you know, the, the first day that it's born, it's born during the daytime and the mother tries explaining nighttime to it but it's never seen nighttime. There's nothing to, to base it off of. Try explaining nighttime or even try explaining water to a baby who's never seen the color blue. Let oh, alone how about blue. us? How about if I said, we're looking at, a, we're on a beach together, looking at a sunset and say, wow, Dave, doesn't that sunset sound beautiful? What? That doesn't make sense, right? You're like, what, right. what are you talking about? Sunsets well, don't make sound. Well, actually they do. <laughs> There's, they, they release a vibration, a frequency that if you were tuned to it, you might, you know, from an electromagnetic perspective, you would be able to hear. I mean, when I when I say that, it doesn't make sense to us, right? Because we're not tuned to listen to what that what a what a what a sound. You know, the universe actually gives off a vibration. It gives off a sound, and and it's it's very interesting. We, we don't we can't hear it, but scientists have been able to extrapolate all the vibrations you know that we can perceive in the universe and and bring it down to a to a to a some base level hum that we can then put on our computer. We can listen to it and say, "Wow, that's the, you know, so." Would a uh, Sean, please, please. I just, I just want to throw a couple little quips on there. Um, number one, you can't fix your hair and put your makeup on without a mirror. Okay, you're not going to be successful. Okay. And number two, I'd love for everybody in your audience to take 20 minutes today and go, where the hell was I last night when I was asleep? Right. Where was I? Where was, where was I when I was asleep last night? How come when I go back tonight, the stuff that I built last night isn't still there? How come I don't walk in like I do at work every morning and see my coffee cup in my dreams where I left it and see my chair the way that it was and see my keyboard where it was on the desk? And yet when I'm here, if I put that coffee cup out in the field, it's going to be there 75 years from now if nobody messes with it and if the environment didn't change based on all those movements we're talking about. I wish more people would sit down and actually ask that question because most people wake up in the morning and say, I was just asleep. And if there was any aberration to that experience, it was just a dream. I'm not saying it was anything else specifically. I'm saying, how come you don't know and you just accepted it? You know what I mean? Like, like most of us, we, you don't just walk out and someone says, why is my face wet? And then someone goes, it's the weather. And you're like, oh yeah, it's weather. No, you learned that it's rain. You learned the difference between rain and snow and sleet. And, you know, you have descriptors for the, these things. We just didn't stop short at weather. So why do we stop short with sleep and dream? Um, so I just want to throw that on there. You, you can't know who you are without a comparison. And if you don't know where you are half your dang life, what are we doing? So I, I did an interesting test actually with some friends a little while ago that um, they're watching a football game. And I just said, uh, in good faith, I just said innocently, hey, guys, you know, how do you know that the game's really happening? And they go, well, it's on the TV. And I go, yeah, but are you at the game? They're like, no, but it's on the screen. Yeah, but what's the screen broadcasting? What's the, uh, dare I say, information structure it's bringing to it? And they're like, part of my English, they're like, oh, shit. They're like, we don't know. Yeah. How so, do you know you're not in a procedural universe where every time you, you've got a cone of view like you do on Minecraft? Right. Where you're seeing what you're playing, but you don't realize the screen's not drawn outside of those angles. I mean, that's, that's that's good philosophical sauce, man. That's good stuff to to add to your conversations and to think about. It's it's a bad rabbit hole to get lost. And it's if, if I could say before Lou jumps in, when I was asking them the questions, notice how ha I had to ask, okay, the TV, okay, how do you know that? How do you know that? It's scaling. You have to scale yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you, you know, it's interesting. Um, perception and the way we look at not just time but as sean said even in our sleep right we have we have we have awake and we have sleep right but in reality there's much more to it um i you know i'll give you a perfect example you know we we say well, it's outside it's snowing outside okay it's snow, it's snow did you know that the inuits have something like 100 and some ways that they describe snow each one is fundamentally different and to them 
it is important because that dictates whether or not they're going to be able to do a hunt, if the hunt will be good, if they have to hunker down somewhere, or if they can go out and, and, and do their daily business. Snow isn't just snow for, for the Inuits and some other cultures. They have very specific descriptors and they understand the nuance. To us, it's like, what do you see? I mean, it's just, just a white blanket of, of, of frozen water. No, 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 not true. And this is the way we have to look at a lot of things in reality, not, and, and sleep is one of them, but I would also say our very own paradigm. Are we, are we recognizing the nuances in, our, in, in nature and in the universe um, that exist? Instead of just saying, you know, time is this way and space is this way and reality is this way. Well, okay, but are we, are we overgeneralizing? As, as, as we do even with something as simple as snow. Chances are, if we're, we're overgeneralizing with something like snow, we're probably overgeneralizing with a whole lot of other things as well. Fractal cymatics, dare I uh, postulate, uh, propose, not saying that is the answer, but just propose. Well, in a nearly infinite universe of patterns, I mean, the easy okay. answer to a lot of these is yes. 